Hell yeah, Jazz freaking Jackrabbit. Now I get to review a good game for once. And guys, this game is very good. Not just good for what it is, not good for its time, it's just plain good. Jazz Jackrabbit was the game that proved to the world that PCs could have good platformers too. Computers were not known for having actually good platformers on them for years. You had all the Euro jank on the C64, Amiga, and Spectrum, and things weren't much better in DOS land. Yeah, you had Commander Keen and the side-scrolling Duke Nukem games, and they were okay, but this, this was on a whole nother level. Finding a game like this is like finding a pack of Starburst that's all the red ones. None of those nasty yellow and orange ones I always threw away. Screw those. So Jazz Jackrabbit came out in 1994 and was developed by Epic. Yes, the Fortnite people. The people whose game store nobody will use despite the fact they give out free games. Damn, you really gotta hate a company to say no to free $60 games. I don't care if Sweeney Bobini eats live cats a free game's a free game. You know if Tim Sweeney and Todd Howard adopted a child together, they could name it Sweeney Sweeney Todd. Just a thought. So Jazz is a platformer very much in the style of Mega Man meets Sonic. I would call the game Sonic with a gun, but we got that. The game's levels are divided into episodes because that's how PC games rolled back then. That way they could sell a shareware disc that only had episode one on it for a really cheap price. And it ended up on tons of shareware compilation discs. And that's how most people played this game. Not many people physically bought the full game because you hardly ever saw it in game stores. And most of the time you had to call epic up and order it directly from them wow how times have changed could you imagine having to call nintendo to buy super mario world actually didn't kanye west do that nowadays you could just buy jazz on gog for a few bucks and you get the whole game and its expansions that's right we used to call dlc expansions and you didn't download them from an online game store, especially not when no 56k modem. You had to go to your game store, ask if it was in stock. If not, they could order it and it'd be a couple weeks before it showed up. Or you called Epic and ordered it and it would show up in two weeks. Ain't that a geographical oddity? Two weeks from everywhere. So the story goes that Jazz was a soldier of fortune doing what the manual calls daring do for those in need. And he apparently only gets paid in rocks. Suddenly a news bulletin tells him that the princess of planet Caratus, Eva Erlong, was kidnapped by Devon Shell, a turtle with a huge hate boner for rabbits after reading Tortoise in the Hare, to which Eva Erlong says, we're all lucky he wasn't listening to the White Album, which I think is a reference to how the infamous killer Charles Manson was inspired to kill people after listening to the Beatles? If it is, that's kind of a dark thing to reference in a comic and a manual of a kid's video game. The comic doesn't stop there with weird references. There's also a panel where Jazz is imitating the comedian Andrew Dice Clay, who's known for being one of the most offensive comedians who ever lived, then goes on to reference Ninja Turtles and Sonic even shows up in one panel. I'm surprised they got away with that. That said, the art style is really cool and it's all drawn by Nick Stadler, who also did all the sprite animations for Jazz and Jazz 2. In fact, they're the only two high profile games he worked on. Hey, if you only work on two good games in your life, make it the Jazz games. Last but not least, Jazz Jackrabbit was created and developed by Aryan Bruce and Cliff Blazinski. Bruce would later join Guerrilla Games and direct the Killzone games, while Blazinski would stay with Epic to work on Unreal and Gears of War. Not a bad resume. Well, that's enough about the history and the story. Let's go ahead and dive in headfirst into Jazz Jackrabbit. Now, Jazz 1 shares a lot of similarities with Mega Man and Sonic, which were some of its main influences. You have a blaster that shoots a variety of ammo and you can run really fast. In fact, the first two stages kind of look like Green Hill Zone if you squint hard enough. Of course, if you squint hard enough, pineapple pizza looks edible. Have you ever had a catfish pizza? Don't knock it till you try it. The levels look great as far as the sprite work, and they're very well laid out with lots of different routes you can take. It's linear, but also not. Wow, I'm really good at explaining things. I should be a game reviewer. Each episode has three planets with two stages each for six stages altogether and then a boss fight. There's also a bonus stage where you can get extra lives. The bonus stage looks like some Mode 7 shit and probably looked really cool when this game came out. The controls have this weird thing where if you're using a controller and you press shoot and up at the same time, it switches your weapon. It's very annoying and when it happened to me, I thought something was wrong with my controller bind. But then I looked at the manual and no, they 
actually programmed it like that. But after some clever mapping in DOSBox, I disabled that. Why did they have it like that? Were they trying to make up for the fact a lot of joysticks only had one or two different buttons? That's like what I tried to make up for the fact I didn't have any tread left on my tires by driving slow. One day, I forgot to do that. This game was compatible with a controller called the Gravis Gamepad that looked a lot like a Super Nintendo controller that got left in a microwave, and it had the weapon switching on a separate button. I would have bought it for the review if it didn't have that weird-ass game port plug. Also, they actually made the Gravis Gamepad a coin you can grab in the levels. First time I've ever seen a controller used as a coin. What's next, a first aid kit used as a spike? The game likes doing this thing where it throws you all over the place with bumpers and springs and anti-gravity and fans and all kind of shit. And it's so fast-paced that you can get thrown around so much you can't even see what's going on anymore. That's why they gave you a slow motion option in the menu that lowers the frame rate of the game. I've never heard of a game that has an option to intentionally make the game run at a slower frame rate. Normally if they have that it's a mistake, but this game with its super fast pacing I can see why they would give you an option like that. I know someone that got motion sickness playing Sonic 2. It wasn't me, I swear. I'll tell you what does give me motion sickness, the FOV some of you gamers put your FPSs at. Y'all put that shit so high you can just about sniff your own ass. Now let me repeat, this game is fucking awesome. This game is great, and the levels are great, but not every level. There's one in particular that just plain sucks. The second stage of the second level in episode two. Yeah, two, 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 imagine that. There's an area where the walls and the floors bounce you around wildly. You barely touch them and you're sent flying to the moon or planet Zablebo board where the aliens pee out of their nose. Man, wouldn't you hate to pee out of your nose? That means you have to stick your head in the toilet. And nobody wants to stick their head in the toilet. Butts have been in there. Anyway, to get out of this area, you need to squeeze into this itty bitty teeny tiny mosquito's pubic hair sized hole. And if you don't get in there in time, the floor bounces you back up into the ceiling. And even if you do get in the hole, the floor keeps bouncing you back up towards the ceiling. And then you have to start all over again. The trick is you have to keep holding right and hope to God that you keep going to the right instead of going up. And then you've got another teeny tiny Nat's asshole that you have to go through. That's Nat's asshole, not Nat's asshole. That would be Nat's asshole hole. I spent an ungodly amount of time just on this one spot in this one damn level. Then I finally just looked up a walkthrough. You're supposed to get a running jump and get on the left side of this wall and then go through the tiny hole. At this point, I was like, oh dear God, please do not lose a life now. Fortunately, I didn't. Actually, after this, the rest of the level wasn't actually that bad. I don't know who was smoking what with that bouncy hole thing, but I want to kick them in their bouncy hole. The bosses in this game aren't anything to write home about. Like most of them, you can just sit in one spot and shoot and take them out. So if I had to give the game one big criticism, the bosses kind of suck, but the music for the bosses is really good. The music in this game is fucking legendary. Composed by Robert Allen and Joshua Jensen, it's some of the best 90s PC music out there. The most well-known song from this game is the level two music, Tube Electric, which sounds straight out of an Amiga crack intro. This track was so fucking good, they brought it back in Jazz 2. Let me tell you something, modern games, you can take your fucking classical orchestral music and shove it up your ass. This is what real game music sounds like. Oh, wait, 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 here comes the best part. <laughs> Yeah, this whole game is full of bangers. This game is a fucking banger, man. And you want to know what's crazy? As awesome as this game is, it's still not as good as Jazz 2. Wait till we get to Jazz 2. The final level of the base game has got you running around spaceships destroying them. What, did I not mention the hoverboard? Yeah, you get a hoverboard. Anyway, you destroy the core of the ships and then you fight the final boss, which is Metal Jazz. 
Remember how I said you can kind of stand in one place and pick off a boss? You can kind of do that with him too, but he moves in just the right places to where you do end up having to move. Anyway, you beat the boss and you get this cute little animation of Jazz saving Eva Erlong. And then they live happily ever after, or do they? And that is Jazz Jackrabbit, one of the best PC games ever made. Later on, Jazz would get some expansion level packs as well as a Christmas level. Maybe one day we'll come back and look at those. And in 1998, Jazz would get a sequel, Jazz Jackrabbit 2, which may be the best PC game of all time. It's definitely the best PC platformer. Nobody has ever dethroned Jazz 2 as far as PC platformers, and nobody ever will. And in a future video, I'll explain why. But for now, we have to close the video. Next time on Working Man Games, we look at a worse... I almost said worst person shooter. That's actually really good. I like that. We'll be looking at a first person shooter that's really shoddy and glitchy, made by a company that's known for shoddy and glitchy games. I'll give you a hint. Their CEO's name rhymes with Pod Tower. Y'all be ready, and I promise to God it won't take so damn long for me to make another video. You'll see another one really soon. I'm Stuart K. Riley, and see y'all soon, I swear.